Good morning, friends. You ready to worship? I'm so excited to be here with you this morning. I missed you very much. Let's worship together. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven right here in my heart father let your kingdom come father let your will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart give us this day give us this day our daily bread forgive us forgive us as we forgive the ones who sinned against us forgive them and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one let your kingdom come father let your kingdom come father let your will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart father let your kingdom come father let your will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart give us this day give us this day our daily bread forgive us forgive us as we forgive the ones who sin against us, forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come, because it's his, it's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours. It's yours, it's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours, forever and ever. The kingdom is yours. It's yours, it's yours, it's yours, oh, all yours, all yours, the kingdom. your kingdom come father let your will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart oh father let your kingdom come father let your will be done on earth as in heaven right here in my heart on earth on earth as in heaven 
right here in my heart. Woo. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, as I said, it's such an honor, a privilege, and I'm so thankful to God that I'm here this morning. You know, oftentimes uh, we're stuck in sickness, and, and, and there's, a, there's a saying, absence makes the heart grow what? Fonder. And I can tell you, it's not just that I was home laying in my bed feeling miserable, but the fact that I wasn't here connecting with you guys, I felt it. And I missed you. And I love you. And I hope, I hope that as we continue to grow in our love and our community, that that absence will be felt not only by each of us, but by those who need Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's continue worshiping together this morning. sing that again. I'm no longer. I'm no longer a slave to fear. For I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. For I the 
see so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and say, I am a child of God. surrender all I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender I surrender all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence day. Savior. 
Just our voices. I surrender. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender. you, Lord. Lord, that's our cry, our heart's cry this morning. God, that we would be wholly surrendered to you. God, that we would be surrendered to the leadership of your spirit. That we would be surrendered to a sacrificial, unconditional love for our brothers and sisters. God, that we would be surrendered to the work that you have laid out for us individually. God, that we would be surrendered to the work that you have laid out for us as a community. speak. If the Holy Spirit is speaking or leading you as an encouragement for us, I pray that you would give it. testimony is going to um, really touch someone's heart or multiple people's heart hearts in this moment during storms mm. and um, it's I don't know you probably have a lot of storms in your lives but being meek in the middle of it it's a challenging mm-hmm. and I find out not only that it's taking uh, a sharp <coughs> knife that is dull going against a grinder. Sometimes God give us that ordeal. And there's some issues I have, especially self-control. God is just uh, binding while grinding them out. Mm. So it'll be sharp. And I praise God that he's in control. I'm not. Thank you. Thank you, Danny.
Okay, so um, actually, I think when I was when I was saying that someone in the in the room had an awesome testimony to share, I was uh, realizing um, it might have been mine. Um, <laughs> Um, so <laughs> I'm going to try really hard to put this into words. Um, I'm 19 years old. Uh, I was saved when I was 18. And my, um, my testimony I felt like it's not very, it's not, it's not a very common one. Um, for me, it was more of a gradual, gradual process of growing to understand the truth. Um, you know, I was, I was kind of in new age practices. Um, when, when COVID happened, um, I really started to question everything going on in the world and um, kind of forced me within myself, and um, you know when you're when you're in your room by yourself or in your house by yourself, um, you have a lot of time to think. And I remember the first prayers I ever prayed were like, "God, I don't know if you're real." <laughs> and then I would finish the prayer like, um, and and I thought like there is nothing wrong with stretching out your hand and say, God, I don't know if you're real. I don't know if you're here in this. You, lo you lose nothing from doing that. That was my thought process. But if I were to be courageous enough and say that prayer, you know, hey, maybe I would, I would gain something from it. And I think that's the message from the Lord right now. Um, yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. God often uses our stillness and our quiet to speak powerfully to us, to move powerfully in us. We're going to talk more about that today in the message, but I um, decided to, to play this song, which probably hasn't been played in many years. For some of you, this may feel like a new song. It's, uh, it's actually just an old song, <laughs> Being Resurrected, so... Secret in the quiet place, in the stillness you are there. In the secret in the quiet hour, I wait only for you. I want to know you more. I want to know you, I want to hear your voice, I want to know you more, I want to touch you, I want to see your face, I want to know you more. I am reaching for the highest goal that I might receive the prize. Pressing onward, pushing every hindrance aside.
reaching for the highest goal. And I might receive the prize. Pressing onward, pushing every hindrance aside. Search the world, but it didn't fail me. A man's empty praise, treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along, and you came along, and you put me back together. Is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, oh, oh there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better. Oh, there's nothing. 
Oftentimes we take the pressure on ourselves to accomplish something and we forget that you are the great accomplisher. Amen, church? God is the great accomplisher. He does the work. He empowers. He makes us great. He makes us great. Thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you for this opportunity that we come together and worship and glorify you. I pray that you would bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Take a moment to say hello, hello to a neighbor, not hello. <laughs>
There it is. There it is. Thank you, Bill on the Horns backstage. Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. So glad you guys can all be here on this January thaw kind of morning. Welcome all of our new members and uh, visitors coming out on their Super Bowl Sunday to hang out with us this morning. So thank you, God, for, uh, for having us. Lord, uh, um, thank you guys for coming. My name is Ben Burtz. We're going to be doing a couple announcements here. Praise God for an awesome worship time, man. That was beautiful seeing testimonies. Praise God. We're celebrating several things going on here today, but uh, if you are a new uh, visitor, maybe here for the first time, we do have a little connection card right here, right in the front here by the, uh, the chair. You're totally welcome to fill that out and put in the offering box there in the back by the doors. It gives a little record of your attendance, and um, I think there's a space on here for if you want prayer for any reason. We're big into that here at New Hope, uh, celebrating Jesus Christ as our new hope. So that's what we're here for this morning. We've got some uh, special announcements. One, the big one, is uh, small groups. Those are coming back. I don't know if anyone's ever been a part of that here at New Hope, but really edifying, very encouraging. There's... Uh, Fortunately, there's three different opportunities to join in fellowship groups, small groups, depending on what works with your schedule. Uh, we've got Tuesday evenings, we've got Wednesday evenings, and we've got Saturdays. Uh, so depending on when that works for you, there's uh, sign-ups there in the lobby, and you're welcome to sign up. This time, it's kind of special uh, in particular because the small groups track alongside the sermon series with the, uh, the I am statements that Jesus proclaims about himself as God. And, uh, and that's really cool because, you know, maybe you're like me, you get a little bit here at church and you get a little bit here at small group. Together, you got a lot of bit, you know, so you're really learning every week and they're really moving the needle forward. Uh, a couple of uh, special announcements. I'm going to invite some people up to uh, speak because they're really intimate with the details. Uh, start off the senior luncheon. This isn't a college senior thing. This is a life senior thing. So uh, if you're 65 and over, you're part of this action. I'm going to invite people peel up to... Uh, Give us a few details around that. Thank you. This is a senior citizen luncheon, and it is going to be at the Lobster House on Friday uh, this uh, month, the 23rd, Friday the 23rd, and it is at 1130, and it is going to be a Dutch treat, and I will clarify that just a little bit. I think there was a little bit of a confusion the last time we did this over to what a Dutch treat meant. There's not a special visitor from the Netherlands. A Dutch treat simply means that you pay your own bill and your own tip. Uh, so it is important that if you're going to attend, if you will sign up in the sheet uh, out in the lobby, there will be one there also next week so that we can get an accurate number for the restaurant. And if anybody has any questions, please uh, catch me after the service. I'll be glad to fill you in. Thank you. Thank you, Pete. Appreciate that. Round of applause. <laughs> One of the ways uh, we just glorify Jesus is by uh, meeting together in small groups or, or senior luncheons, just a lot of ways to get to, together as a church body and edify and encourage one another and be part of the uh, church community. Um, also, I want to invite up uh, Martin Walker, who's going to be talking a little bit about some different ways and opportunities we can be involved, uh, as well as the Lord leads you in your heart. So, Martin Walker. There, okay. So, uh, we're looking for uh, deacons to join the church council, and this is as found in uh, 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. Uh, so as it says here, deacons responsible for coordinating and implementing the ministry and affairs of the New Hope Community Church under the leadership of the elders. So we complement, support, and supplement the work of the elders. So uh, please uh, think of who you would like to nominate. Uh, do we allow self-nomination? Don't know. So, yeah, okay. So please uh, pray, and if you have names to suggest, please come forward. And uh, let uh, our church council president, Victoria Fitch, know if you have any names or if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Round of applause for Martin Walker. Thank you, Martin. 
All right, just a couple final ones, but big ones nonetheless. Uh, we're celebrating a new birth coming our way, Lord willing. Uh, for Phoebe Yip, Tim and Phoebe Yip are uh, expecting, and we are celebrating with them. There is a baby shower coming up on Saturday, February 24th at 10 a.m. at the ROM lines. And um, if you're interested in being part of that, there is a sign-up sheet there in the lobby, and you can sign up and uh, bring something if you'd like to be part of that. Uh, after the service here today, there's going to be a uh, prayer service uh, and uh, prayer ministry. For anyone who might have prayer requests, that's available to you to uh, partake in after the service. All right, lastly, the kids. I'm going to be uh, uh, sending you guys out. So there's a kids class today. If you're a kid, then stand right up and uh, get your running shoes on. I know you guys like to blast out of here, so I'm just going to pray for you and, and thank God. Lord, thank you, God, so much for our kids, our youth here, Lord. Thank you so much for their young, fertile hearts. I pray you would just be planting uh, seeds of truth in their hearts and help them to uh, enjoy time with their teacher and classmates today. Thank you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, kids. <laughs> We're going to be welcoming up Aaron Reed Aaron for the service today. Well, good morning again. How's everybody doing? Still, st still awake? Excellent. I'll do my best to keep you that way. Let's see how it goes. As I mentioned earlier, I'm just so thankful to be here uh, this morning. One of the things that stood out to me as I was kind of listening and reviewing the sermons from the past few weeks is that God is speaking to us. God is speaking to us. Even though your full-time pastor has been bedridden, that wasn't a hang-up for God in dealing with his people here at New Hope. And we are so blessed here to have an abundance of incredible teachers. Amen? Let's give a round of applause. It is such a gift. It is such an amazing gift to have so many gifted teachers. And I would say it's kind of what we've been doing, but realistically, I've only been doing this for a few years. So what we do is at the beginning of the year, since I've been here, is we put together a New Year's one-off series, uh, which means we have a bunch of guest speakers come in, um, from among us, and they give a one-off sermon. And what this allows me to do is it gives me time uh, to kind of gather myself from the end of the year, because um, the end of the year, a lot of times, there's a bunch of things moving really quickly, and then there's things that go on the back burner, and I try to get those things wrapped up. This is an amazing gift. Many pastors do not have that type of gift to be able to be like, all right, I'm just going to step back and not preach for a month so that I can catch up on the things I didn't get to do. They just have to work a whole lot more. But guess what? You guys are so kind to me. <laughs> and I so appreciate it. So this time's incredible. And an amazing thing that came out of this, praise be to God, is that I was sick for two Sundays. And guess what? We didn't have to find last minute coverage. Isn't that awesome? People were actually prepared. We didn't have to put people on the hook. What I love about the fact is as I look at these one-offs, and this is not the first time, but when I look at these one-offs, oftentimes, there oftentimes there's a narrative that God is speaking to us through these one-off messages. It's amazing. Why do I think that's amazing? Well, because Glenn and Beverly and I are so thankful to have each other and so thankful that we get time to invest and be intentional and listen to the Holy Spirit to come together with sermon series that, Lord willing, are honoring to God and important for this season, right? What I love is when my little fingers have nothing to do with it and the Holy Spirit speaking, right? That's awesome. That's awesome for me. I look and go, wow, God is so good. His plans are better and greater and higher than mine could ever be. And Lord willing, we're tracking. 
we're tracking with him and his plans for us. I'm going to read you a little story. And many of the, this, this story will probably be incredibly familiar, but I just want to refresher for us. Matthew 7, 3 through 5. <clears throat> Jesus is speaking. I'll give you a minute if you want to look this up in your, in your Bible, and it'll be up on the screen. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye, you hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Word of the Lord. Well, if you've been here for a few weeks, I'm excited because this will just be recap for you. If not, all the sermons are available for you to listen to online. I'd encourage you, have a listen. The last three sermons have told a story. I believe it's the story Jesus told us here. Okay? Glenn, three weeks ago, warned us about assumptions. And he gave us a bunch of beautiful examples of how our assumptions get us into trouble And what I would say is our assumptions often leave us seeing specks of dust that aren't even there. Our assumptions often, often lead us to seeing specks of dust that aren't even there, probably because our heart condition isn't right. And so the plank of our own self-righteousness or pride is making many things look like specks of dust in those around us, right? Right? There's a plank in your eye. It's hard to see much of anything, let alone a speck of dust. Out of curiosity, I was like, I wonder how many times pride is mentioned in the Bible. So I, I did a quick search, and it really depends on what translation you're using. But the word pride shows up in tr some translation as many as 158 times. I don't know how many word searches you've done, but that's a lot in the Bible for one word to show up. And I only read through about 30 or 40 verses before I could see that there was a similar warning with every single one. Pride's bad. <laughs> Pride's bad. Over and over and over again. And that isn't even with me digging into references of um, let's say um, haughtiness, that's another word that gets used in scripture. Self-righteousness. There's all kinds of words that point back to pride that would add verses and verses onto this concept of pride and the warning against pride. We should take that seriously. And so assumptions get us in trouble, Glenn said. And I would say they cause us to see dust. They cause us to see dust. Sometimes dust is there. Sometimes the dust is, is seen because it's coming off our own plank. <laughs> right? So Harvey then steered us into what? Repentance. Repentance. What a beautiful service. And I hear the response was incredible, and that's amazing. I would say repentance is the acknowledgement of the plank. Repentance is the acknowledgement of the plank and surrendering the plank to God so that he can remove it. 
Now, we often do a good job finding planks and putting it back into our eye, right? So this isn't a one and done type of situation. But what's really neat as we look at what Jesus is saying here is that God can use the body of Christ to be a support network in plank removal. That's awesome. Do we have that? That's the question today. By the power of Christ in our surrender to the leadership of the Spirit, we can be a powerful piece of plank-free living. So why then is this still an issue? Why is it still an issue? I ask myself that. I ask you to ask yourself that. It hasn't gone away. This has been an issue for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. <laughs> Why is this still an issue? Well, I think in our culture, in our time, I look and I see that we live in an incredible fear of vulnerability. Okay? We live with incredible fear of vulnerability. And this fear can be based on experiences that we've had with those who we've been vulnerable with and they've betrayed our vulnerability, right? It could be based in that. But the danger is that indulging this fear leads to what I would call backwards living. And we're gonna dive into that in depth today. It's not the way we want to live. We sang about it this morning. We're not slaves to fear by the power of Jesus Christ. He freed us. It's for freedom's sake that he set us free. To be free of what? Bondage. What kind of bondage are we talking about? Fear. Pride. So then Laurel brings us to this place where she says, bloom where you're planted. And she talks about the implications of us blooming where we're planted. And ultimately what I would say is that she's saying, living life that brings glory to God in our own lives, but also into the lives of people around us, right? And this is where it can get incredibly tricky. And Jesus Makes it tricky in his story. What's he say at the end of this uh, Matthew 7, 3 through 5? He says this, and then you'll see clearly. Clearly to do what? Clearly to do what? Do we remember? To remove the speck from your brother's eye. Interesting. That's a tricky thing. That's a tricky thing. I don't know about you. How do you remove a speck or help a brother or sister who has a speck without coming off like a real tool. Right? We've all been there. That's a tricky thing. It's a tricky thing that we can't do without Jesus and without relationship, right? If we don't have the relationship, if God hasn't, unless the Holy Spirit moves in, I mean, the Holy Spirit can do whatever he wants. He can move into a situation, allow you to be the great speck remover, and everyone's just gonna be like, glory to God, but oftentimes, there's a relationship that's involved. I'm going to tell you a story just this week. Because not only is it incredibly tricky to love someone unconditionally and show them their, your love for them and for the Father by helping them with a speck, it's tricky to receive that, right? It's tricky to receive that. This week, I'm writing an essay for my application to seminary. I'm going to be taking some classes in the fall. I know you're all very excited for me. I'm very excited for me, too. Um, so <laughs> I'm putting together my essay. An area where I am not so strong is writing. Uh, I'm very comfortable public speaking, if you haven't noticed. Very comfortable. But when it comes to writing, I'm a bit of a potato. 
And so I'm, I'm writing up this essay, and I want it to be good. So I did it for 45 minutes. The writers in the room are going, oh. <laughs> and I finished writing this essay. I'm like, whoo, that's glorious. I love it. I'm reading the words. That's me. That's all me right there. So you know what I did? I go, okay, you know what I need? I need a critic. I need someone to critique this. I couldn't think of anyone better than my wife. She graded papers for 16 years at the college level. So I'm like, here you go. I can't wait. She's going to love it. Well, I come back. After, I, I literally, I was in the office here. I drop it. I say, hey, just give it a read. A little corrections. Fix my grammar. You know, be hard on me. And then I come up here and I worship for a little while. I was preparing myself for the very best. And I come back and I sit down and she's like, well. I'd give it a solid 70. I was like, 70? Oh. She started walking through some of the feedback, and as it's coming, I'm like sinking lower and lower in my seat, right? I start asking myself questions. Should I even be taking classes? <laughs> It's hard to have the spec pointed out. And that's not even regarding my lifestyle. And that's when I asked for it. That's my intro. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord God, help me. Father, I just pray that you would uh, be moving in the word today. Lord, that you would be pointing out ways that as a community, we can become a community of plank-free living by the power of your spirit. Lord, we pray that you would soften our hearts and minds, that you would open our eyes to the planks in our lives. Bless this time in your name. Amen. Amen. So the text we're looking at today, looking at briefly, is, um, is 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 12. And I'll give you a minute. Now, about your love for one another, we don't, do not need to write you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. What a statement from Paul <laughs> to hear. Oh, get a letter from Paul and say, I don't need to teach you about love. You got it. Way to go. Good job. High five. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. There's an interesting bit. He says he can't, doesn't need to teach him on it, but then he says, yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life you should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you so that your so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. We see throughout Paul's letters again and again this concept of living lives that not only take care of themselves, but take care of others. I think it's in Ephesians 4.28 when Paul talks about don't be a thief, work with your hands, make money to do what? Give to others, right? And and we see this repeated, repeated, repeated. Here Paul is addressing something interesting with, uh, with this community, and that is the fact that they're so enthusiastic about the second coming of Christ that they've kind of wandered into stagnation. 
That's remarkable. But basically, they're like, God's coming. I don't need to work right now. I'm just going to hang out with my friends and wait for the Lord. But Paul says, don't wait. Don't just wait around. Don't be stagnant. Don't make a fool of God's people. And there's a whole sermon that could be preached on that. But what I really want to look at is this concept of, at the beginning of 11, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. I don't think that's how we think. I don't know how many of us, I mean, maybe. It's probably more common in the North Country, actually, as I know many North Country people might actually be like, it is my ambition to live a quiet life. That's why I live in Parishville, right? Like, <laughs> but, um, but I think oftentimes if you get caught up in the cultural stuff, that isn't usually our ambition to live a quiet life. I love this statement from Charles Barkley. Um, uh, is it Charles Barkley? It might not be Charles Barkley. Will, William Barkley. Uh, and he says, he says this. It is our lives which must be the sermons to win men for Christ. That is, that is what he's doing. Is He's looking at this text in Thessalonians uh, Barclay says, it is our lives which must be the sermons to win men for Christ. But that may not look like what you think it looks like. It may not look like what you think it looks like. It might mean that your life looks very different from what our culture presents. Aaron, where are you getting these crazy ideas? Well, let's start by looking at Jesus, right? He's a great example. The best. Let me ask you, what was Jesus doing when he was 20? Carpenter working with his hands, right? Okay, so we know that he was, he was likely uh, learning under his dad, working with his hands. But this is God, right? Jesus, son of God. And yet we know nothing about what he was doing at 20. Isn't that interesting? It's almost like his ambition was to live quietly and work with his hands. The same at 25, 28. Hopefully he's getting better at his craft. Well, you might say, well... Yeah, but let's look at Jesus in ministry. That's what I'm interested in, ministry, right? Let's look at his 30s. He's got 30 to 33, Jesus' ministry. What's his ministry look like? Well, I'd love for you to show me the passages where Jesus is chasing a crowd. Or where he says to his disciples, listen, there's not enough of you. So go, get some friends, and bring them back. In fact, we see multiple moments where he runs from crowds. Not like in a panic, right? But like, <laughs> he's not pursuing it. He's walking away from it. One of these examples is in Mark 1, 35. I love this. I love this. Jesus raises, he gets up very early in the morning. It's still dark. He departs, went out to a desolate place. And there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And when they found him, they say, everyone's looking for you. And he says to him, let us go on to the next town. 
that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went out on to throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons. I just love that Simon comes and everybody's looking for you. We got a whole village of people looking for you. And it seems like Jesus is kind of like, let's get out of here. I talked a little bit about backwards living, and I want to just touch on this a little here. We'll continue to touch on it a little bit. And I mentioned it a little bit in our leadership summit, but so often in our culture, we live lives where we display everything we believe is praiseworthy, right? And we hide everything we think is not praiseworthy. Social media has only multiplied this by many, many, many times. You know, you're sitting in a cafe, sipping on your latte, Bible out, time with Jesus. Right? (laughs) Just bring that praiseworthy stuff forward. What's interesting is that when you look at Jesus' ministry, What happens when he heals the blind, raises the dead? What does he say to him? Shh, don't tell anyone. Imagine yourself sitting in a prayer meeting. Suddenly some dead person raises and Jesus says to you, shh, don't tell anyone. You're like, what are you talking about? How's that gonna bring you glory? I gotta tell everybody. This dude's raising dead people. That isn't what he did. Don't tell anyone. That's backwards, right? It's backwards from how we live today. Any good thing that happens, let's throw it out there. Anything we believe that's not praiseworthy, let's make sure that stays tucked away. And, you know, I mentioned that it's multiplied today, but this was something as a kid I experienced. You know, coming to church as a kid... You get up in the morning, get in the bathroom, brush your teeth, comb your hair, put your best clothes on, man. Get in the door, don't be a punk, smile, your life is great, right? At eight to ten years old, that's kind of what it felt like. Kind of sets you up to live a backwards life. Sometimes life doesn't feel like that, right? You're not feeling like wearing your best or coming in and being like, life's great. <laughs> Joy of the Lord. I'd like us to be different. And I believe we are. This is awesome. I think we're a community that doesn't come in with our Sunday face on. That disguise of like, I've got everything together. I just don't think we do that. That's great. But we can continue to grow in that. That's the encouragement. We're going to look at another text that deals very specifically to the ways we can live quietly and differently today. And this is Matthew 6, 1 through 6. It's Jesus again speaking. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, 
they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door. Pray to your Father, whom is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Jesus says, makes this statement, phrase of statements, twice in this text, where he says, the Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And what I would like to argue is that what is done in secret paints a more clear image of one's character than what is done in front of people. And so my question to all of us today is, how's your secret life? How's your secret life? T.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity says this, Surely what a man does when he is taken off his guard is the best evidence of what sort of man he is. Surely what pops out before the man has time to put on a disguise is the truth. If there are rats in the cellar, you are most likely to see them if you go in very suddenly. But the suddenness does not create the rats. It only prevents them from hiding. In the same way, the suddenness of a provocation does not make a man an ill-tempered man. It sh only shows me what an ill-tempered man I am. The rats are always there in the cellar. But if you go in shouting and noisily, they will have time. Uh, they will have taken cover before you switch on the lights. Lewis is referring to how one reacts when not given time to clear the rats out of their reaction. What I am saying is that when you have no one to project yourself to, and you look into that cellar with night vision goggles on, what are the names of the rats? I'm going to invite up the worship team. We have a cool opportunity as a community. I talked about being a community that isn't afraid of being vulnerable and that this can be very challenging. And I'm not suggesting that you're able to be vulnerable with everybody. I think I was reading a book by Dallas Willard recently, and he talked about the nature of our relationships and being able to have these types of like close, vulnerable relationships being limited to a few from his perspective. But what I would like us doing as a community is pursuing those types of relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Right? Maybe you have them. God bless you. Um, maybe you could grow in the ones you have. We've got these home groups coming up, five of them, on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Saturday, I believe it was. This is a great opportunity to test, try, and challenge yourself to be a little more vulnerable. We don't want to be Christians that live backwards lives, as I call them, where we display everything praiseworthy and hide everything that we believe is not praiseworthy. In fact, from what we read today, we see Jesus saying, hide what is praiseworthy because the Father sees what's in secret and the reward is great. And scripture tells us 
to confess our sins to one another. See how that's a little different? The secret praiseworthy stuff, that's something we do for God. The things that we think aren't praiseworthy, that's something we bring to God. And our brothers and sisters can help us walk through that, but only when we are able to be vulnerable. Let's live lives that are satisfied that God sees the unseen and we don't need to seek seen approval. Let us shed our fear of being vulnerable with God and with close brothers and sisters. Let's pray. God, I thank you for today. Lord, I just pray that you would be building us to be a community that is so close to you and so loving of each other that we can be a community that fosters plank-free living. God, I pray for myself that you would be revealing to me even now ways that I haven't surrendered planks in my own life over to you, ways that I'm wrestling with pride or self-righteousness or sin. Lord, I pray that you would be moving powerfully in our relationships with you and with each other as we go into this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together. joy of my salvation and renew a right spirit within me and renew a right spirit within me and renew a right spirit 
back. So um, I have a, I think I might be the person with a testimony. It just took me some processing time, which if you know me, that, that fits. And that line, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, kind of, I was like, I don't know if the testimony's going to fit because it's not so much in line with the song. But um, then that line, yeah, that's what God did. Um, so I have just walked through an incredibly painful and difficult time um, from which I desperately needed rescuing. Um, and there were so many times. It was about eight or nine months, and it felt like an eternity, and there were so many times that I just lost hope that God would rescue me. Um, and I thought, there's no, like, is there even a guarantee? Like, I'm not, like, why, why, why do I, why can I believe that God would rescue me? Like, what, you know, yeah, I really wrestled with that. Um, a lot, and this is a very condensed version, but as we sang No Longer Slaves, it just, um, so much of it resonated in a new way, and as I sang I'm a Child of God, I got my answer, and, you know, he had, he's, he's rescued me and brought me out, but I sang that line, and I'm like, I'm your child, we're his children, he rescues his children. He doesn't leave them. He rescues them. And um, this is the first time I've felt good enough to be on the worship team in months. Um, and I'm so thankful to be up here. Um, so I just, yeah, just wanted to share that and say that God rescues his kids. And when you feel hopeless, there is hope because of Jesus, because he, he went through all the bad stuff <laughs> so that we could have the peace and have the joy and have the hope that would never, ever fail. sing in for a minute, but I'd like to invite up the prayer teams. So if the prayer teams can come up. If you need prayer today, maybe there's a crown that God's revealed to you this morning, a plank. I want to give a space. And maybe it's, it's personal. I'm not asking you to be wholly vulnerable big step, but there's also stairs here. You can come kneel before Jesus and offer it up to him personally. So if there's a plank that God's revealed to you this morning, we have prayer teams over on my left here, and there's stairs right here if you want to just offer that up to God. We're going to sing through this again. So 
God, as we go forward today, as we walk into our week, we pray that our lives would be a sermon that would win people for you. God, we pray that we would live differently. God, that we would listen for how you would have us live quietly. Lord, I pray that you would be strengthening our relationship with you and with our brothers and sisters so that we can, as our vision statement says, grow together towards maturity in Christ. Lord God, bless us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There are prayer teams up here if you need prayer. Uh, There's fellowship time in the back. Enjoy some snacks and fellowship together. Thank you for being here today. God bless you.